couple of Sundays ago, at 8 30 in the morning down Fellowship Paul where the men are having their little get together with coffee and whatever we can find to eat. Sometimes eat very much, unfortunately. We got talking about jury duty. Well, I mentioned you no know, six, seven, eight months ago, I got a questionnaire from the U.S. government about being on a federal jury. Well, so I filled it out. I said they were required by law to do that. And then we got talking about two weeks ago. I didn't mention about that. And apparently, nothing ever came up, but they never got contacted. Yesterday, I checked the mail. And then there's an envelope from the U.S. government congratulating me on being chosen to be on a federal jury, a grand jury, on January 3rd. So we'll see what happens there. But that just tells you, be careful what you talk about. Now maybe we had to talk about that more than this would never happen, I don't know. Or why is it, well can't you find a way to get out of it? You know, well, when you read it, it says, Federal laws are very strict on getting out of it. If you're attending your own funeral, they may let you off. <laughs> so I guess I'll be going down for it. I get to call a Friday before to see if they really need me or not, but we'll see what happens. But you know, this morning, our scripture is in the book of Hebrews. And it'll be chapter 11, it's going to be verses 32 through 40. One thing I struggle with this week is we're getting closer to Christmas is trying to find something different to, to do a sermon on about Christmas. You know, you do the sermons about the same old thing about Christmas time and everything, right? You know, I thought, well, I'm going to do a sermon about Christmas trees. And as far as I searched, I could not find a scripture to mention Christmas trees in the Bible. But then I got a phone call Thursday night, or late Thursday afternoon, from an elderly gentleman up in Liverpool that we helped with his uh, electric bill, the Metro Alliance did. You know, he, he'd been in the hospital for quite a while, and, and he's getting ready to go home, and he found out he had a shut-off notice, he needed some help, so we, like, we elected as Mr. Alliance, even though he didn't live in the turban area, to, to help him. But he just felt like it's the right thing to do. Well, Thursday afternoon, he called me to thank, to thank me, and we got talking for a little while, and he got talking about his faith. He's had a lot of health issues recently. And he's already had several surgeries, and he said, but it's okay. He said, when I was growing up, my mother talked to me about faith. That no matter what you're going through, have faith in God. And we talked a little while longer, and all of a sudden he says, you know what, I don't know why I'm going to tell you this, but I just feel like I'm led by God that faith may be a good sermon. So guess what? Sermon title is one is faith is the victory. Amen. You know, in our society today, winning tends to be everything, doesn't it? You know, I got a text from one of my boys yesterday. There's a group text that all came my four boys. We have an ongoing group text. And of course, the first, right around, I don't know, seventh or something like that, I get a text saying, Kyler Murray, oh you, hide the trophy. Sorry. I know that's not too pleasing to just turn in and build. Oh, he's welcome, okay. And so I got thinking about that. Oklahoma celebrating this guy getting the Heisman trophy. You know, a lot of people around the country are celebrating it. But I got thinking, is it being celebrated up in heaven? Probably not. But no, everything in our society today is success oriented. You gotta be a success. Even the church has acquired the success syndrome. In fact, over the last two decades in our country, we've gone accustomed to the to hearing the concept that true faith is always evidenced by tangible success. Proponents of what has come to be known as the health and wealth gospel have built television empires that sell their ideas that unless you are healthy and wealthy, you're not living up to your potential. 
Anything less than tangible success that leads to your comfort and prosperity in life is shamed as being, as being because of your defective faith. So when any failures, illnesses, tragedies are ruled to be outside the will of God and beneath the dignity of a Christian. I ask you this morning, is that what the Bible really teaches about faith? And the answer I hope to, for every one of you is a no. In fact, to believe this is false gospel. False gospel about faith is, is to ignore the principle that there is a difference between spiritual success and material success. There is a difference between being deemed a success by the world and being deemed a success by God. When somebody accepts Christ as their Savior, do you hear the world cheer about it? Scripture tells us when somebody accepts Christ as Savior, the angels can't be seen. Amen. That's right. The author of Hebrews gives his summary about the great heroes of faith in the Hall of Fame. He gives two different principles about faith in our scripture this morning. This faith is extremely important for the, you know, the other day I had to drive us some fog. You know how confusing fog can be when you have a real heavy fog, you're saying, we're, we're in on the road in my hat, we're, where's my turn coming up? In fact, it was only a little over a year ago, Bo Smith was leaving home in the fog to go to work. This is a road that he probably traveled hundreds if not thousands of times. He leaves his house, follows the road out to the highway, gets to stop sign because it's a, it's a T right there, and he, he turns right and goes to work. Because the fog was so heavy, he became confused. He did not see the stop sign. He did not slow down. And he went through that intersection and ended up in the farmer's field. Fog will cause confusion. So I'm hoping what we talk about today will help get rid of that fog of confusion. Today we will see a twofold nature of faith. First thing we're going to see is, is exciting victories of faith. And secondly, we're going to see the enduring virtue of faith. If you look with me in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, starting with verse 32. And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, and Samson, and Jephthah, also David, and Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith subdued, subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to fight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. So others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskin and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, and whom the world of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. So the first thing we're going to look at this morning is the, the victories of faith that we see in verses 32 and through the first part of, of verse 35. In verse 32, it's as if the writer realizes that he doesn't have time, or time will not allow him, to continue a detailed account of heroic exploits of the faith. The, the verses before this, he went into detail about Noah and about Abraham. But when he gets to hear the scripture in Hebrew, he would feel like he's running out of time and he needs to get all this stuff in so he didn't go into complete detail. He says, and what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also David and Samuel and the prophets. Here he divides himself to six figures that we've all read about in the Bible. 
whose lives span from the time of the judges to the kings and also includes the prophets. These are men who are mentioned are intended to be suggestive of a host of men and women who lived throughout the, throughout the Old Testament and also lived for God in a hostile world. Gideon, the first visited, is a powerful example of faith in that he and 300 select men routed the Midianite army with torches and empty jugs. When Gideon first put together his army, he had thousands. And God kept saying, that's too many. So he, he cut it down. God said, that's too many. He cut it down again. God said, that's too many. When he got down to 300 men, God says, that's just right. If you want to read that story, it's in the book of Judges, chapter 7. Barak, when the judges ruled Israel, was a when judges were ruling Israel, he was a military leader who, along with Deborah, led Israel to defeat Sisera and the Canaanites. You find that also in the book of Judges in chapter 4. Samson is usually remembered for his great strength, but not his faith. Yet in spite of his weakness, he was a great champion of Israel during the period of the Palestinian oppression of the state of Israel. You can find that story in the book of Judges, also in chapter 13. Then you got Jephthah, often, often remembered for a, a very foolish vow that he made. But he placed his faith in God and relied on God's power to overcome the Ammonites. David, a man who made a lot of mistakes. You remember saying before, David broke every commandment written by God, all ten of them. And there have been 15, he's broken off 15. But he was first and foremost a man of faith. In fact, David is called a man after God's own heart. Because of his faith and his desire to do the will of God, to do what God wanted him to do. A man named Leon Morris points out, points out that each of them inside of here had defects in their faith. Gideon was slow to take up arms. Barak hesitated and went forward only when Deborah encouraged him. Samson was enticed by Delilah. Chapha made a foolish vow and stubbornly kept it. Although their faith was less than perfect, it did not keep them from being used by God. Then the writer named Samuel. Samuel, who was the first of the prophets and the last of the judges, he started as a young boy and continued through his life serving God. Last we named in the list are the prophets. Now the prophets here remain unnamed except for Samuel. All served God cheerfully, courageously, and confidently accepted commands from God and faced whatever opposition came their way. We look here at our scripture at verses 33 and, and the first part of 35. The writer details some of what they had began to be able to do through faith. It says, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions, quenched the fire the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to fight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Now if you look at these accomplishments, they look like stuff out of our childhood fantasies, doesn't it? Slaying dragons, vanquishing evil, beating the odds, rescuing the damsels in distress, laughing in the face of death, Escaping the nick of time and always looking incredibly easy, easy to do it. First, we see the broad overview of the results of these believers of faith. They saw political victory through faith, they subdued kingdoms. Amen. They achieved moral success in government as they worked righteousness. And they achieved spiritual reward in that they obtained promises. 
That is, they receive words of promise from God. Second, these believers also saw various forms of personal deliverance. Those who stopped the mouth of the lion. We all know that's a reference to, to Daniel, who was thrown into the lion's den and left overnight. But when they checked on him the next morning, he was unharmed. Daniel 6, 23 says, because he trusted in his God. It was Daniel's friend, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who quenched the violence of the flames when they were thrown into the fiery furnace that we read about in the book of Daniel, chapter 3. Many of the prophets, including Elijah, Elijah, and Jeremiah, escaped the edge of the sword. Stories such as David and his defeat of Goliath when he was a young kid and only had a sling to fight him with. It gave Israel a victory over the Midianites. Which demonstrated out of weakness, he was made strong. The Old Testament contains many examples of this. Examples of groups, groups who became valiant in battle, turned to fight the armies of the aliens. But if the faith of God's people could boast of those spectacular achievements in the form of military victories, miraculous deliverances, and, and, and the raising of the dead to life, it is no less inspiring than to read about the willing endurance of those who faced horrible torture and cruel death. So the second thing we're going to look at this morning is the enduring virtues of faith. In verses, in the second half of verse 35 and down through 40, it describes the accomplishments brought through faith that gives us a completely different outcome than what we read in the previous verses. It also mentions the words others in the second half of verse 35. If you read with me now with verse 30, second part of 35 through verse 38, it says, others were tortured not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trials of mocking and scourging, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn, sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskin and ghostly as being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. We've seen a transition here from those previous verses to these verses. And it's important. we got to show that not all the men and women of faith experienced miraculous deliverances. Some of them were tortured and they were killed. Having true faith in God is no guarantee of comfort. There's no guarantee of security in this life. There's no guarantee things are not going to go wrong. God does not always work miracles. Well, the Greek word for torture literally, literally means, in this text here, means to beat as a drum. Well, when you look at it, most of the commentators... And theologians believe that this reverse refers to Eliezer, who was stretched on a drum and beaten to death. Others were not only physically tortured, but they had to endure mocking from the people that hated them. Now we're starting to see some of that in our country today. Where as Christians, we are starting to be mocked by people. We're being mocked by our friends, by our family, because of our beliefs. And if, so the verses 33 through 35a sounded like a dream. These following verses sound more like a nightmare, don't they? Many of us can identify with the last part of these verses. We feel that we're living a nightmare rather than a, than a dream. We don't seem to be conquering any kingdoms. Rather, evil seems to have its way with us. The lions are devouring us. The fires are consuming us. The swords are cutting us in pieces. We're just not having 
the great victories that we think faith brings. But it takes a greater faith to endure the hardships. Paul distinguishes the people of the first half of the people of the second half of the last half of the text. In some cases, it's absolutely nothing. In some cases, the same people are listed in both halves of this text. They saw wonderful victories, and at other times, they endured incredible defeats. The people in both parts are characterized by one thing, and that's faith. They all had faith. The writer says in, in verse 39 that all these had faith. It says these others had faith. But God did not deal with them in the same way he dealt with those that experienced victories. And if we go through this, you're going to find out that it has nothing to do with your faith or lack of faith. That's why these things happen. These not men, not no men and women of faith were not delivered from give difficult circumstances, yet God honors their faith here in Scripture. In fact, it takes more faith to endure than it does to be saved from things. These believers are like the three Hebrew young men in the, in the book of Daniel chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. With threat, with fire, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. These three men had a faith that we can only dream about. They stood there before the king and said, Our God can't deliver us from this fire. But they also said, And if he doesn't, it's okay. We're still not going to worship your false idols. One cannot help but think of the contrast that these verses draw with the health and wealth philosophy taught by some today. This philosophy said that God wants all of us to be healthy and wealthy. Well, that's the case. In my case, God better hurry up. Because I haven't got there yet, and I've just turned 60 recently. But according to this view, the only reason you're not experienced it is because you do not claim it in faith. You ever heard of name it and claim it? Some preachers on TV preach that. If there's something you want, then name it and then claim it. I challenge every one of you to this right now. Next time you go down to Oklahoma City, I want you to find the most expensive house in Oklahoma City. I want you to go in that front yard. I want you to name it. That that house is yours, then I want you to claim it. I want you to walk in that front door and sit in that living room and then tell me how that works out for you. <laughs> don't call me for a bell. I don't have it. But that's what some of these preachers are teaching now. Health and wealth, name it and claim it. You know, portions of this chapter emphasize the exciting victories of faith. It was mentioned that some escaped the edge of the sword. Yet in verse 37 it states that one of the hardships of faith was that some were slain by the sword. No, Elijah escaped the sword. He escaped the vengeance of Jezebel. Other prophets of the same period were slain. Jeremiah's life was delivered from the king, but his fellow prophet Uriah was slain by the sword. His body cast into a common grave. You read about that in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 26. By faith, one lived, and by faith, the other died. Faith did not always deliver believers out of suffering. Sometimes it delivered them through suffering. In the time of the apostles, you read about this in Acts chapter 12. Herod Agrippa kills James with the sword, but Peter escapes. In spite of the fact that the world held these men and women of faith, 
in, in low esteem as not how God held them. God held these people in high esteem. God said to them that of whom the world is not worthy. These people that were slain for their faith The world was not worthy of them. So when you're going through your troubles now, I know there's a lot of us here in this church going through suffering right now. We're going through trials and we're going through problems. Remember this, what God said about these, these people that dead, the same thing goes for you. The world is not worthy of you. It is said that they did not accept deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection in verse 35. How can the death of a martyr be a better resurrection? Better than what? The answer is we enter the previous context of the first part of verse 35. That's where it talks about the women received their dead, raised their life again. Both saw their sons who were restored to life by Elijah and Elisha. But these sons died again. The resurrection that the martyrs aspired to was a resurrection to eternal life. That is the better resurrection. And we're told about that in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. These women pray that their sons be resurrected. But when this body dies as us as Christians, we have a much better resurrection than coming back to life again here on earth. God can restore us if we die, but then we're going to end up dying again. So our better resurrection leads us to eternity. A testimony that their faith, rather than being extinguished by severe taking of prayer, prevailed. These believers died without having possessed the promise. In spite of this, they persevered in faith, knowing that faith's reward is not always given now. The final outcome on earth is not major, a measure of victory in the race. Now, what's it talking about with this promise here? Christ was our promise. Amen. These men and women of great faith in the Old Testament did not get to hold on to that promise yet because Christ had not been born. However, we do have the promise because Christ was born 2,000 years ago. He died on the cross for our sins, for us. That, is our, that was the promise. We got to receive that promise with the ones in the Old Testament. They had to look forward to it. They knew it was coming, but when they died, it had not happened yet. John Piper says this, the common feature of the faith that escapes suffering and the faith that endures suffering is this. Both of them involving, involve believing that God himself is better than what life can give you now. And is better than what death can take from you later. When you have it all, faith says that God is better. And when you lose it all, faith says that God is better. What does faith believe in the, in the moment of torture? That if God loved me, he would get me out of this? No, that's not what faith says. Faith believes that there is a kind of resurrection for believers which is better than the miracle of being rescued. Right. It's better than the kind of resurrection experienced by these widow's sons who had to die again. A modern example of one who has had this kind of faith was a man, a man named Dietrich Bonhoeffer who left his prestigious position as a professor at the University of Berlin to join the ranks of those who stood against Hitler and the Nazis within the German church. A professor of systematic theology said that Bonhoeffer was foolish, saying, it is a great pity that our best hope in the faculty is being wasted on the church struggle. God chose for Bonhoeffer's route to that of the saints in the second half of Hebrews 11. He was arrested and imprisoned. He was officially hung on the Fossenberg, in the Fossenberg concentration camp. 
His body was tossed aside into a pile of corpses and burned. His death came only two days before the Americans liberated the Flossenburg camp. As he faced the fury of the Third Reich, Bonhoeffer said, the ultimate, the ultimate responsible question is not how can I heroically make the best of a bad situation, but rather, the coming generation can be enabled to live. In verse 40, as the author brings to conclude his list, his list of heroes of the faith, he says, God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. He said that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Do you see what he's saying here? When he uses the word perfect, it means complete. He's saying that this story, God's great story of faith, is not complete without you. It is not complete without each and every one of us here. We are a part of the story of faith. These men and women of the Old Testament that live by faith, that are in the hall of faith, they're not alone there. We're, we're a part of that faith too. He's saying that this story, God's great story of faith, is not complete without you. We are a part of God's story of faith. God looking down through the ages foresaw that our lives would be a would be a part of this great story of faith too. To me, that what a privilege that is that God looks upon us the same way He looks upon these heroes, what we call the heroes of faith. The testimony of these witnesses is that all believers can finish the race. All believers can live by faith. And that through faith, all believers can accomplish great things for God. In conclusion, the life of faith is not something reserved for a few elite saints. It's reserved for each and every one of us to, that have trust our lives to Christ. A life of faith is possible to all kinds of believers in all kinds of situations. The life of faith is possible for all of God's children. And just like the song says, says, faith is the victory. Please stand with this one. We have our invitation.